Ah, uh, my phone is ringing. Let me see what's going on here. What type of a time is this for my phone to ring? Let me actually come over here and pause the music and say, this is Doss. Hey, Doss, this is Tori. Hey, Tori, how's it going? Fantastic. You're I attempting... love your show. Oh my gosh, you're going to make me crash into the space station, though. <laughs> you, like, you called me at the exact time that I was doing my rendezvous with the space station. Oh, no. <laughs> it's okay. I'm under control. Thank you so much for joining us. I completely appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. Excellent. So you've been watching us for a little bit, right? Yeah, I have. How I do you? I love the show. It's so much fun. Thank you for that. We have way too much fun doing this. We play some video games and we talk about space and rockets and science and stuff. And when well, we play some video games, don't tell anybody. But uh, it's, it's just <laughs> way too much fun, man. Um, what I can do is let's do a sound check. Sound check. Chat. Everybody in chat. There's 1,500 people watching us right now. Can we hear Tori okay? Is everybody good to go? Um, do I need to turn him up? Do I need to turn him down? Let me know if his volume is nominal, chat. And Tori, if you want to talk a little bit, they can Sure. Oh, sorry. No, no, that's okay. We're doing a sound <laughs> I, check here. I'm getting distracted by watching the, the uh, chat stream on the side. <laughs> it goes like crazy sometimes. There, there you go. <laughs> um, up. All right, guys. I've got Tori bumped up about 50%. Tori, if you can How's give that? us... How's yeah. oh, that? Is that is that better now? That sounds fantastic. That's AOS right there. Now we got okay. you loud and clear concerning chat there. Um, so you've been watching us for a little bit. And were you around when I kind of showed the the mug design, where we were trying to uh, have kind of the reusable space infrastructure? I was. Um, Y'all kind of have some things like that that you're looking at, aren't you? Yeah, we are. So we are developing a fully refuelable and reusable upper stage that we call ASUS. That uh, would, you know, it would, it would replace Centaur on the on the Atlas, and it would go up but never come down. You know, once you've invested all that Delta V, we're just going to keep it up there and uh, refuel it with gas that we bring up as sort of excess capability on subsequent flights, and do exactly the sort of thing you're describing. Exactly. That's once you're to orbit, I guess what we say in Kerbal Space Program, once you're to low curve in orbit, you're halfway to anywhere. It actually is more than halfway to anywhere on us. But once you get equipment yeah. up there, once you get that stuff in place, it makes sense to keep using it as opposed to splashing it down or crashing it into something. Um, it makes sense. You got the investment. Like you said, you spent the Delta V. Let's keep it up there and keep doing stuff with it. Um, let's see here. Oh, I'm, I'm reading chat as well. Oh, it's, it's everybody's just going off the chain in chat. Um, so that's what I've been trying to do over here as well. We didn't call it ACES. All of our acronyms are food related. But we have these little things that we called the MUG, <laughs> the Mooner Utility Tugs. And we were trying to do the exact yep. sort of thing, like inspired by your ACES kind of concept. We wanted, once we paid to put this stuff in orbit, to keep using it. So do you want to tell us about some of the like challenges that you've come across in terms of technologies that need to be developed so that ACES can work? Or what do you want to do? Sure. It's your mic. Well, you know, the big challenge and the big game changer is duration. So today, you know, we fly Centaur on top of Atlas, and that's the longest flying upper stage, you know, that flies in the world, really in the highest performance, because it's cryogenic, because it's liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen fuel, and what limits the life of uh, hydrocarbon upper stages is space is so cold. You know, you end up being a big block of ice after a couple hours. Yep. Well, Centaur can fly for, you know, seven or eight hours. It can do three separate burns because space is too hot for Centaur because cryogenics are that cold. But still, seven hours, that's great, but you can't do a lot. You can't build things in space with that kind of duration. Yes. And so ACES changes that whole game. A single propellant load of ACES, we can fly for over a week. Welcome to the Academy. Academy. We can also take fuel up and refuel and literally be up there operating indefinitely. So, so that's the big breakthrough. You said and we do that with... Oh, well, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, Doc. no, no. Go ahead. Um, you, you said something about space being too hot, which is a really interesting thing to say. Everybody's like, man, space is so cold. What do you, what do you mean by space is too hot? Well, when we talk about cryogenic propellants, you know, we're talking, you know, minus, you know, almost 300F and 
you know, over 400 F. So these propellants continue to burn off. When you're looking at, you know, an Atlas or a Delta sitting on the pad, watching the countdown, and you see that steam coming out of the side of the rocket, right? those are the cryogenic propellants boiling off because, you know, obviously it's so much warmer here on Earth. Right. That continues in space. That's how cold those propellants are. And that's what limits the life of a cryogenic upper stage, boiling off so that we finally don't have enough pressure or volume of propellant to do the job. So that's just the, the temperature inside the tank raises, which means that you have to let it escape? Like you can't just trap it inside forever, like indefinitely? Exactly. It's just like putting a, you know, a kettle full of water on the stove and turning up the burner so it starts boiling. If you didn't let it vent, eventually, you know, you'd have a pretty big mess in your kitchen. <laughs> gotcha. So is, is ACES just about developing like a more like a stronger pressure vessel that can withstand extra pressure or what, what makes it able to withstand the heat of space? Well, we, re, we let it boil off, but then we capture the boil off. And rather than just venting that propellant to space as waste, ah. we recycle it and we bring it back through a tiny internal combustion engine. Right. It actually runs compressors, puts heat back in, repressurizes the tanks, replaces our batteries with a big electric power generator, ah. and even replaces our hydrazine attitude control system by piping that waste uh, hydrogen and oxygen to thrusters. So it greatly simplifies what you'd see on a Centaur, but extends the life by orders of magnitude. So, so just by taking what's, what's typically a waste product, right? When you see the stuff kind of going off the side of the rocket on the pad and that sort of stuff, that's like a waste product. And instead of just exactly. wasting it, you're using it to power the rocket. You said you could generate electricity. You repressurize the tank with it. You replenish the hydrazine reaction, like the reaction control system. That's brilliant, actually. Who's building the engine, the, the little engine? I've got to ask the question. x -Core. So we're, we're working with a small company called Roush. Right. It's going to do a little IC engine. And, uh, and then we haven't, of course, we haven't picked the you know, main propulsion engines yet for the, uh, you know, for the, uh, the stage itself. We're still looking at engines from Blue Origin and Aerojet Rocketdyne and x -Core. But gotcha. the, the IVF that you mentioned earlier when you were talking about uh, your mug, I just which is that what we just described, yeah, that's the heart of the system. And that's, uh, that's with our partner there. Absolutely. Cool. And, and, of course, it's going to change the way you go to space. You know, when we have that capability and there's ACES floating around up there, we'll stop flying to destination orbits. There'll be no reason ever to go beyond LEO because right. you take what, you know, whatever payload you can barely make it to LEO with and just stop there. And ACES will swoop down, pick it up, and take it wherever it needs to go. It's almost like, like a ship docking at the port and offloading a bunch of cargo and then having like, like a semi-truck or a train or something carrying it the next part of the, the train. Instead of having the ship like grow legs or wheels or something and drive up on the land and keep delivering it to downtown Houston or wherever, you have a different sort of delivery mechanism for the second part of the journey, right? Exactly. Excellent. And so that makes some big changes in the way we'll do things in space. With that amount of time and that con ops, we can start actually building things in space. So we can take pieces up, or take very large structures up in pieces. We call that distributed launch. Right. You know, today, full satellite, you were just building a satellite to survey on the moon for you know deposits. Yep. That was cool, but you had to do the whole thing, right? You had the sensor, you had the power, you had yep. the attitude control system. And when you got all done, that had to fit underneath the payload fairing and go on an existing rocket. Yep. You don't physically really interact with the spacecraft once it's up there. Well, this changes that. With ACES, we can practically take giant spacecraft or giant structures up in pieces, and with that long duration and all that uh, delta V, we can assemble it up there in space. And that makes a lot of sense. We do the exact same thing in KSP. We, we come to the point where we want to design this huge, awesome, like, interplanetary cruiser or something, but it's so big, it's hard to design a rocket that launches it off the pad, right, from the surface of, of Kerbin, exactly. our planet. It makes a lot more sense for us to construct the things in orbit and kind of dock it together than it does to design this one insanely massive rocket that can lift it off the pad. That's 
being able to construct things in orbit is going to be game changing for uh, it's game changing for us in KSP. In the real world, it's going to be game changing for humanity. Is the right way to say that? I mean, everybody oh, absolutely. sees. Oh, okay, I'm so. As we're talking here, I am uh, setting it up so that my little uh, scanning satellite is going to crash into the moon. That's not what I want to occur. Um, and I do kind of keep on going. When I let you talk, I keep on doing things in the game here. Um, I've got myself with an impact trajectory. And while we could explore a very small surface of the moon, if we were to impact into it for ore, it's better for me to go into a polar orbit. And I explain this every time, like in KSP, um, when we go into a polar orbit, we're going around the kind of the poles of the planet, right? And I can draw it on my screen right quick. Um, we are going around the planet, not around the equator like this orbit that you see here, but we go in kind of a, a highly inclined orbit so that we go around the planet or moon like this. And as we go around the poles, the planet's also going to rotate. The planet or moon is going to rotate underneath us. So by going into that polar orbit with our scanning satellite, we'll have the capability to scan the entire surface of the entire body, as opposed to if we were in the equator, we could just scan the part around the equator. So in the game, it requires that we put our scanning equipment in a polar orbit, and it kind of simulates time where the planet will turn around and let us get the rest of the planet. So that's what I'm doing right now. Let me get, oops, that's my epic pen. Let's get that cleaned up and come over here. So, let's... you do a great job explaining orbital mechanics. Thank you for that, sir. I completely appreciate that. It's, uh, I, I used to be a computer programmer, and I've kind of just watched videos that, that are released by people online and read about it and, and kind of that sort of thing. So I try to do like a translation sort of thing, you know, for people that aren't rocket scientists who aren't like orbital mechanics. Um, so they can get it because it's super complicated in the detail, but it kind of a broad stroke it's something that anybody can understand. Like, if you know the kind of basics, oh, I push on this and it moves in this direction, you can understand this stuff. It's a lot of fun. Let's and, of course, one of the great discoveries of our time that you will find in your polar orbit going around the moon is water. We're yes. finding water everywhere. And not only do we need water for to support people, but, as you know, water is rocket fuel. We talked about that earlier. We've got two H's and an O in water, and if we break it down, we get some hydrogen, which we can use for our rocket fuel, like our, our liquid fuel named in the game here. And we've got oxygen, which is kind of an, our oxidizer, so not only do we get to breathe it, and then, of course, someone in chat said, we don't just breathe oxygen, we also breathe nitrogen. And, and I was like, okay, but we breathe oxygen, okay? Um, <laughs> but we can breathe it, so we can use it for life support stuff, and we can use it as rocket fuel. And that's, I think we mostly find it as ice, right? Yes. Yes, there's about 10 billion metric tons of water ice at each pole of the moon. And this is going to be the thing that really allows us to be a multi-planetary species. Because not only do we have all that water which we need to sustain human life, but now we have propellant and we have it up there where the delta V you know, hurdles are so much easier. Yep. That'll be one of the first economic activities in the cislunar economy that we talk about. We'll be mining water to create propellant so that we're no longer even bringing propellant from the surface of the earth. It's its own self-sustaining, entirely space-based business. Yep. All we have to do is uh, get the equipment up and not take all of the uh, mass, which right now, the way rockets work these days, science fiction aside, um, most of the mass of any mission is the fuel for the mission, right? Absolutely, 90% of the rocket. So even, you know, even a modest rocket going to GTO will maybe deliver, you know, a, a 10,000 pound satellite. Yep. It'll be a million pounds of rocket sitting on the pad and almost all of that is propellant. Yep. And we just blow it up and throw it out the back end of the rocket so that we can get the little teeny tiny top part of the rocket into orbit. So it makes a lot more sense to get that from a, you know, a cheaper sort of gravity well, a less powerful gravity well like the moon as opposed to the earth. Um, the exact same way that we do it in KSP. I'm scanning the moon for ore because I want to set up a gas station on the moon. And instead of paying KSP's like about 3,500 delta V for us to get to orbit because we're scaled down, instead of paying that 3,500 delta V, I only want to pay the 600 delta V to get off the surface of our moon in the game. So it makes so much more sense to just launch the equipment and then fill it up in space with these kind of moving gas trucks. Exactly. You have hit the essence of what's going to be this, uh, you know, this cislunar transportation system, this highway in space. Absolutely. Um, let me scroll through chat and see if there are any questions. I saw a question. Somebody asked uh, what inspired you to get involved in science originally. 
Well, you know, I'm I'm old enough that I watched the moon landings, and that, right. you know, everybody just went crazy about that. And I, I, you know, I've been building rockets my entire life. I built my first rocket when I was about ten or twelve. I found a case of moldy old dynamite in the back of my grandmother's barn. Okay. And <laughs> I opened, I opened that. You know, I was a dumb kid, and so I, I got that case of dynamite out and. Uh, you know, I, I remember I remember clearly, I have this clear memory of being really kind of struck by why this dynamite in the middle of a hot, dry August was all wet. Right. And, and of course, anybody who knows anything about old dynamite knows that's because it swept the nitroglycerin out onto the skin of the sticks of dynamite. Well, that doesn't sound and dangerous so you, at all. No, no, not at all. You know? So I just took my pen knife, you know, and I cut the sticks open and I pulled up a paper in the powder and I packed my own rocket motors. And wow. I'm proud to say, Doc, that a few of those rockets made it partway into the sky before they detonated. I'm happy to say that you're still with us after digging in a stick of dynamite with a pen knife. Um, the funny thing is KSP was kind of the same sort of genesis. Um, the creator of KSP made the concept of the Kerbals because he used to like make little tinfoil guys, right? And he would launch them on little SD style rockets. Um, and he was interested in space and science and that sort of thing. And he came up with these, he used to call his little tinfoil guys Kerbals. And one day later on, he's in the world and he's doing programming for like a PR firm or something. And he says, you know something, I want to make a game about space. And I want to kind of go back to the, to my childhood love of having these like little guys and exploring and blowing things up. I mean, you can't get away without saying that. Um, but that yep. was kind of his history, just getting started at a young age. I used to launch little rockets in my backyard. In fact, we're going to do a stream, like a family start a stream, where we'll build a rocket on the stream, and people at home can, like, follow along. And then I'm setting up the equipment to be able to stream a small model rocket launch. Maybe oh, that's so cool. Onboard cameras from a little, like, SD-style rocket and transmit that back live to Twitch is one of the projects we're working on this summer. So... Oh, I love so much different possibility. I, Go ahead. I I have one bone to pick with you and the creator of Kerbal. Uh oh. I hadn't played, I hadn't played the game in a couple of years because I used to play with my kids and then they went away to college. And right. Just been so busy. But when we decided we were going to do the show together, I had to get on this weekend and I'm addicted now. Gosh darn it. <laughs> the, the new headlines say ULA ceases actual rocket operations because. CEO is playing KSP. <laughs> Could happen. <laughs> let's let's not do that. Please keep doing real rockets. I would appreciate that. <laughs> oh, all in chat. Everybody in chat is saying ha ha. <laughs> oh, let me scroll through here and find another question right here. Add GoPros. Add GoPros to the rocket. Uh, yeah. Okay, here we go. Oh, this is a good question. In KSP, we take it for granted. Mayor of Space says, uh, in KSP, we take it for granted that we can refuel everything, but in real life, most spacecraft cannot do that. What physical mechanisms are required to get it to actually work? Because we don't do a lot of orbital refueling right now, do we? No, we don't. We really, that's very rare and almost never done. Hmm. And of course, that's one of the key enablers that we just talked about a few minutes ago on ACES. Right. So we've been developing that technology also working with NASA. And for cryogenic propellants, it turns out it's not that difficult. Really? Uh, oh, yeah, no, you can. Uh, the, I don't want to give away all the secret sauce yet. So okay. I'll just say that you know, the basic thermodynamics make it an almost passive fuel transfer if you do it just right. I mean, it'll literally tank itself and tank to nearly 100%. Huh. If if you're if you're guarding the uh, the secrets there, I can explain people how we re refuel in space. What you do is you right click on one of your tanks, and then you hold down the Alt <laughs> key and you right click on another tank. I've only actually got one tank on this rocket, and then you just click the Out button, and that will transfer fuel from one tank to another in KSP. Um, <laughs> so if anybody asks, well, you can say, <laughs> just just tell it's them all. It's gonna be a little bit more complicated for us, <laughs> I'm afraid. <laughs> it's just a simple right click. It's no big deal, really. C clearly not rocket science. <laughs> Um, any other questions? And guys, in chat, if you have questions, be sure to start your question with the word question. I've got a special program on my end that pulls out anything that starts with the word question. Um, yeah, somebody asked how you right-click a real rocket fuel tank. You just mouse over it and right-click <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah, sure. 
Um, I was watching you play that uh, payload fairing, and I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. You know, it takes us a little bit longer to do that in our factory. <laughs> <laughs> there were, we were actually talking about payload fairing yesterday, and, and we were looking online because a lot of times during the stream, we'll do research, right? And this was actually over in EJSA streams, one of our, one of our other KSA streamers. Um, we were trying to figure out, I don't know if you can tell me, how much it costs to build a fairing. Are they super expensive? Like, are they insanely cheap? I mean, they look like they're carbon fiber and they have to fit very no, well. Yeah. But... No, they're, they're not actually insanely cheap. They are expensive. And they are. I, I won't give you the actual, yeah, I'm not going to give you the actual numbers, but I'll tell you, it's in the millions of dollars. Really? That We were yeah, guessing yesterday, are... and we were just like, ah, I mean, oh, yeah, what could be $100,000? That's not These enough. are very, oh, no, no, no. You know, you, you might think that, but. They're, they're very sophisticated structures, very, very high performance. Because, you know, you, you see that when you play Kerbal, that they're dealing with all of that really just extreme aerodynamic heating and buffeting, and uh, they have to be uh, super, super strong, but at the same time, really, really lightweight. Because, um, you know, on the upper stages, you know, a fairing comes off somewhere during first stage flight. You know, every five pounds of fairing is costing you a pound of payload right. as a rule of thumb. And then what we don't really deal with so much in the game is those aerodynamic um, environments and the buffeting creates pressure and noise underneath that fairing. Right. It would literally kill you if you were in there and would damage the spacecraft. And so the interior of the fairing is also a sophisticated machine that absorbs a lot of that acoustic energy and mitigates that before it uh, you know, can harm the, uh, harm the actual payload. So it's not just like you slap some fiberglass together on top of the rock and be like, well, it looks about aerodynamic enough. There's a lot more science <laughs> that goes into the creation of the fairing, and, and therefore there's a lot more investment that goes into the creation of the fairing, it sounds like. Absolutely interesting now we know i mean we sat around and, and we were googling and we had like 500 people trying to google for the answer to this yesterday and the secret is pretty well kept because we could not figure out how much it costs but it's in the millions of yeah, dollars it, it is it's one of those competitive things you know which yeah, size yeah. your space yeah. can it fit under the fairing and all that kind of stuff so that's why people don't talk about it but it is a lot more sophisticated device than just a simple cover very cool all right, I am uh, finishing up my capture burn here. So I, I was going zinging by the moon. I set my up for a, set myself up for a polar pass on the moon, and I'm going and going to uh, slow myself down so I can go into this polar orbit. And now I've got a fantastic polar orbit around the moon. So my payload here that fit inside the little fairing because this was one of our probably one of the least complicated payloads that you could make in KSP. You should see some of the fairings. Sometimes the fairing extends the entire width of the rocket and the entire, like, not the width, the height of the rocket. That's not impressive. The width of the rocket. Um, but we make some pretty shenanigan-y fairings in KSP. Um, <laughs> but I've got my stuff in position here. I need to go ahead and extend all the solar panels and stuff. We'll send the command to the spacecraft, again by right-clicking, um, to go ahead and deploy its solar arrays. And uh, we will put it in orbit of the moon here. There we go. And now I should be able to right-click. Again, more right-clicking. All space exploration is done via right-click. Um, and we can <laughs> perform an orbital I survey. Clearly you have to get a right-clicking mouse. I, can I think if ULA just creates right-click technology, I think you guys will be way ahead of the game. <laughs> <laughs> um, so now I'm transmitting the data back home. And now I've got a planet full of ore. And we've got a cool little interface here. A moon full of ore. And I can come over here and I can find only the richest ore deposits. And it looks like I've got a couple craters that have a pretty good concentration of ore. I can, my viewing scope lets me kind of like thin down the, the range. So I'm only looking at deposits that are greater than 70% of the max right now. Um, and I can change the colors and styles. I kind of like the dots. Eh, no, I like that one better. We can make it green. But now I've identified a couple potential landing sites. And it's interesting. One of the craters is kind of filled with ore. So we could land a base down there. We don't even have... We don't have anything on site yet. Um, in another crater, it almost looks like the ore is the ejection from the, tri from the crater. So the crater itself is devoid of anything useful to us. But the area surrounding the crater has a bunch of resources. How does it work in real life? Would we look at, like... Would we expect to find that ice at the bottoms of craters? Is it something that's just scattered around the surface of the moon? Where where do we look for that stuff? 
So what we've discovered on the ice is that it tends to be on the bottom of craters where it's sheltered from the sun. Ah. But the ore itself, the other precious metals, I think this is a very realistic depiction. Some of it will be material brought there via asteroid impact, and that'll be inside the center of the crater, and other materials will have been on the moon and have been moved around by those impacts. And, of course, in our cislunar future, we're going to use additive manufacturing to take that ore and not just only bring it back to Earth, but in space begin fabricating structures out of it. So it's not just about fuel. Exactly. Ah. So the different resources could be found in different locations, like the ice, like some of these high latitude craters up here where maybe they don't get a lot of sunshine because they're protected by the crater wall or something. Um, I don't have that, but then again, I'm scanning for ore and not, not water ice. Um, maybe in the polar regions we could expect that just because we have less uh, exposure to the sun, whereas on the equator we may get more exposure to the sun that causes the ice to boil off and migrate to other parts of the moon or the, the body. Hmm. Exactly. So when you go to the moon, and if you were doing something kind of like an, like an ISRU sort of thing, you don't just go and land in one place and get everything you need, it sounds like. It sounds like you might actually have to go to a couple different places to extract resources that you can use. Oh, absolutely. There will be prospecting and mining and searching for things. Just very, you know, the, the type of scenario you talked about while you were constructing your probe was very realistic. Excellent. Let's go out first and prospect and find where the most easily accessible and highest concentration of resources are, and then we'll go there to mine them and use them. Excellent. That's the next thing that I'm going to do. So, chat, everybody that's watching, I have a little bit. Of, I don't know if you were around to see this. Um, we didn't want to copy exactly your Zeus sort of landing idea, so we've got a juice lander. Um, <laughs> that we've designed here, and we've got it on a little bit of a fuel depot here. Um, and we've got the common backstage, just like you guys were talking about, taking the Centaur, mm -hmm. taking the common stage that we use for our mugs, that we use for our orbital insertion stages, just the common sort of thing. And we've got a crew module on the front of it. Um, so we've got the main engines at the back, the crew module at the front. We can carry two Kerbals to and from the surface of the moon. We even put in the uh, kind of VTOL, we call them VTOL engines, but the downward facing engines so that our design mm -hmm. is the same sort of like Zeus design that we looked at a PowerPoint and found out about. Um, where we would use the main engine to kind of slow down and come out of orbit, and then we would use these kind of VTOL downward pointing engines, we'd switch modes, and use those to do our landing on the surface of the moon. So the next thing that I'm going to do, I'm going to take a scientist and a pilot down to that crater where we found the ore, and have them do a landing down there and see if they can get any more information about it, while we continue answering some questions from chat over here. In a follow-up question, somebody asked um, if you've ever thought about reusing the fairings, thinking that they're, uh, observing that they're expensive. Are they the type of things that you could reuse? Are they just so stressed during the launch that it's a one-shot sort of thing? Yeah, they really tend to be a one-shot type of thing, even though, you know, they're expensive and we use, you know, the M word to describe them. Right. But, you know, relative to the rest of the rocket, they're not as valuable as other things that are a lot easier to recover. Gotcha. And of course, once the fairings are separated, they get all kinds of pretty intense aerodynamic loads. And, and if you don't capture them, you know, they hit the water and they get, you know, they get roughed up pretty good. Yeah, so we, gotcha. We tend to, you know, we let those go and, you know, our, for, you know, our reusability efforts in the first stage are going to focus on the engines themselves. Right. Because the rocket engines are about two-thirds the cost of the first stage booster. So we're going to grab those and get those back first. Yeah, it does. It seems like it makes a lot of sense. I've seen you're talking about the smart reusability, right? Exactly. And instead of like trying yeah. to take an entire rocket and slapping wings on it and have it glide down or something like that, you're having uh, just the engines come down and then catching them with a with a helicopter sort of thing. If, if I recall correctly, right, it's like a parafoil comes out and you catch it. You try to catch it with a helicopter. Yep, that's exactly right. So we sort of. You know, wanted to look at it from a systems engineering point of view where, you know, what's valuable and what's heavy. Right. Because heavy is hard to sit back. Yep. Valuable is yep. what you want. And when we looked at it, we said, well, you know, the tanks are really heavy and they're the least expensive thing on the booster. All the value is in the engines. And they're not actually that hard to get back. Right. We tend, right. instead to cut them off with an explosive separation joint. It's existing technology. In fact, the earlier versions of Atlas Right. Uh, you right. know, Atlas III used to do that. It, they, it had four engines, and it would cut two of them off, almost like they were miniature stages. 
for performance reasons okay. and just drop them, in, you know, drop them in the ocean, if you will. So we know how to do it. In this case, we'll cut them off. We're going to inflate a, an inflatable hypersonic reentry shield that NASA is developing, and we're working with them. Right. So that they'll come reenter hypersonically, protected by that inflatable uh, shield, then deploy a parafoil, and we'll swoop in and pick them up with a helicopter. Also technology that's been demonstrated before. And when we do it that way, not only do we get our engines back for pretty minimal cost, right. the environment that they experience coming back to Earth um, are actually gentler and more benign than they experienced going up. And they're not... So refurbishing... Yeah, they're not yeah, all burnt yeah. up or charred. Huh. So they, we should get a lot of reuses out of them because of that. A couple, There's a couple cool things on that that you made. You said that you dropped some engines off. Every time I've done that, because I've done that in KSP where it's like, well, I need some more thrust. Let's just tack an engine on the side on some explosive bolts and throw it away when we don't need it anymore. And everybody always calls shenanigans. They're like, there's no way. We don't drop engines in real life. You're so shenanigan-y, Doss. Now I can say <laughs> that they're wrong. <laughs> uh, absolutely. That was a bona fide technique that was very common back in the 60s. <laughs> no kidding. When, uh, yeah, when, you, when the, you know, the, the thrust level of the engines was limited you know it takes time to develop the engine technology and the right, thrust right. level gets bigger and bigger so when we first started with the early atlas in titan rockets you could only get so much thrust out of the engines. right you'd have to put a bunch of them on there which were very helpful yep. in the early yep. stages of boost thrust is everything in the later stages it's more about energy and isp right so right. these early yeah. missiles that might have four engines on them and they would go up and they'd uh, breach the thickest part of the atmosphere and then just drop two of the engines off and continue on with the other two. And keep on going. And it's not like the fuel tanks, it wasn't even a booster. It was just like an engine slapped onto the side. That's, that's amazing. Exactly. That's fantastic. <laughs> um, let's see here. More questions. There's so many questions. Chat, thank you so much for being patient. There's no way that we'll be able to get to every single question. But I complete. Oh, I'm shenanigans anyways, and they love me for it. Cool. Thank you, book. <laughs> um... Let me see if I can grab another cool one out of chat here. Deet, deet. Did you see The Martian? Oh, yeah. yeah. Loved it. <laughs> That's another one of the things we did on the stream here. We recreated all the events of The Martian in the, the sort of mission profile um, in KSP. That was fun. That was, it. that was a space filler question while I scroll through and find a real question. <laughs> <laughs> that was my vote for best picture. In fact, I've seen the movie three times now. <laughs> nice. Excellent day. Uh, let's see here. I'm scrolling up. Okay, there's that one. More. There's a lot of fairing talk. We talked about the fairing so much yesterday. Guys, I think the long and short of it, we're not going to see any fairings delivered to the moon and used as astronaut hot tubs, okay? Let's just... Uh, we, I think we can <laughs> stick a fork in that one. Um, let's see. Doo -doo -doo, here we go. Oh, somebody asked, what do, you, what do you think of Kessler syndrome? We talk about it a lot in KSP. It's not very like dangerous for us but just the concept of having so much space junk floating around in space that it may be uh dangerous to operate something like asus because of all the junk that people have left around well exactly so it is a growing concern it's not really a you know a limiter or a problem today but as we look to the future there's going to be even more and more things going on in space and it is going to be a problem if not addressed Right, and we think that'll be one of the early you know, sort of missions uh, for ASIS is beginning to clean that stuff up. Right. And in fact, we're working on a technology now that we would retrofit to Centaur that would make it even easier for customers to fully comply with the orbital debris mitigation standards that uh, that the U.S. government has published. So, if you you know for your folks who are not as familiar with that, you're basically supposed to do one of two things: either take your spent stages and equipment and deorbit them back to Earth, or you're supposed to take them to a designated sort of parking orbit. You right. can think of it as the junkyard that everybody's agreed, this is where we're going to put our stuff. Okay. And, and when your rocket is sort of stressed in its capability for a big heavy payload or a very difficult orbit, right. then on a modular system like Atlas or Delta, you know, if you need more energy to do that, we add a strap on. We add another uh, solid you know, rocket motor. Okay. And that costs more money. So sometimes customers are reluctant to do it. So oh. we're going to develop a technology that makes it really, really cheap and really, really easy 
to always fully comply. So just you might you're going to hear about that later this year when we announce it. Excellent. I that's actually really cool. We've talked about it. We do, we try to do it in KSP because uh, while we're not the real world, um, the more pieces of junk we have flying around our orbits the less kind of like powerful or the more our computer has to process, right? So for us, we're not we're right. destroying the environment or anything like that, but we're kind of destroying our KSP computer environment and making our entire game run slower when we're not good space citizens is, is the term that another one of my guests, Dr. Jones, used. Um, he said, you should be a good space yeah. citizen and you should clean up after this junk. Don't let it just kind of float around. So we do the same sort of thing in KSP and we've got a couple different technologies in KSP, mostly involving explosives that we can utilize to uh, deorbit pieces of junk. I'm trying not to crash here because I'm landing on the moon. <laughs> While I'm talking, I'm landing on the moon. Um, but we, we, we're always using the term, you know, be good space citizens. This is not as flat as I had expected. Um, but it's flat enough. Bang. Okay, cool. So now we've got our juice landed on the moon so we can do a little bit of science. Um, let's see. I, I like the horizontal architecture you've adopted similar to ACES because it's so much easier to get payload and people in and out of that lander. Than it the is. Vertical it is. Instead of, <laughs> don't tell anybody, instead of something like this, which is super shenanigan mode, and you'll see it in just about eight seconds, um, <laughs> if my Kerbals had to egress from the equipment like this, they're going to have a little bit of a problem because the hatch is up on the end. We have really powerful reaction wheels in the game, Tori. Um, <laughs> <laughs> don't you wish you could do this? Um, so yeah, instead of the cool. crew and equipment having to like jump out or use an elevator or something like that, having that, I had never even thought about that. The horizontal architecture in the real world makes it easier for you to unload some of the stuff out of that. That makes a lot of sense. That mm -hmm. makes a lot of sense. Oh, let's see here. Oh, here's one. What's Mr. Bruno's favorite payload as a ULA, a, a ULA rocket has launched? Do you have a favorite payload? Welcome oh, to wow. the Academy. All the payloads. Well, my favorite payload is the one that's coming up in about a year and a half, which is when we start taking astronauts back to the space station on top of Atlas. Excellent. So that's an upcoming payload. Yes. Nothing, I mean, there's nothing like human space flight. Absolutely. And we're, you know, we're all very excited about it, and we're very mindful of what, you know, that responsibility. You know, we have a perfect record. You know, we're at 105 launches now, which is unprecedented, but it's a whole nother game when we know that there's people there. And so, you know, I have a photograph of the first crew sitting on my desk, and all our employees have the same thing so that we remember, you know, what we're doing. You know, we're taking people up, and lives are at stake. Absolutely. I think we did we did one of the tests. Um, I remember we did one of our streams a year plus ago where we brought in a big Delta IV Heavy and we put ourselves a little, it was a Corian on top, right? <laughs> As opposed to mm -hmm. a Orion. We have to put in K in front of everything. Um, and we, we talked about what they were testing. That was when they were doing the reentry and the shoot tests and stuff. And we had the big Delta IV underneath it and we, we got it launched and we kind of, that was one of our shows we did before. So that is fantastic. Let's see here. That was an awesome mission. I mean, I you know I love all my rockets. People always ask me, "What's your favorite exactly. rocket?" Exactly. I can't. I, I can't have a favorite, but I'll tell you, the heavy is really cool. <laughs> I've got something. Before you leave, I'm going to launch something um, on top of like a, one of our one of our Delta Four sorts of things. I don't have a Vulcan yet because um, I know your your next up and coming thing is like the Vulcan and the BE fours. I haven't made that, but I do have a big Delta Four that's just a fantastic vehicle to watch launch. It's just it looks like a serious rocket. Like, you look at that thing and you know that that's a rocket. You're like, yep, that's a rocket. <laughs> um, well, I'll was... tell you what, I was, I was at the Cape for that uh, Orion launch. And, uh, you know, I, I, I've done almost 400 launches over my career. And I get excited for every one. But for a heavy, oh, my gosh, I had to run outside. Right. Because even, even two and a half miles away from the pad, you can feel that shock wave hit you and you can hear and feel the rumbling inside your chest when it takes off. There is nothing like it. I hope to see a rocket launch in real life. I've never actually seen one. When, when I was a kid, I always wanted to go see the shuttle launch, right? And it's just, you know, I got to be an adult. They were still launching shuttles. I never went. We'll do it next month. We'll do it next month. And then all of a sudden, you know, they're not launching shuttles anymore. Um, 
I am going to come and observe one of the rocket launches because I, I can't, you can't even imagine. Like, we're talking on the internet, we're describing, like, this force that hits you and the amount of power that it takes to put those rockets up in, into orbit. I don't think that we can do it justice talking about it online. It's something that you probably need to, like, experience in real life to really gain an appreciation for. Absolutely. And, and Das, you, you will be my guest. Just let us know. We fly every month. We'd love to have you down for one. I careful what you wish for because Das Valdez will show up. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, there was another really pertinent question over here. Um, one of the things we talk about in KSP a lot is that, oh, well, real rocket engines don't start and stop and start and stop and start and stop 20 times a mission, right? Real rocket engines can't run at like 5% throttle, right? Um, right? In terms of ACEs and engine starts and stops, that's clearly something you've got to think about. Is that something that we can stop taking heat for for doing in KSP? Yes, you can. So that uh, engine is going to be able to be started and stopped almost an indefinite number of times. Is there a big like like technology leap, or is it just it costs a little bit more to make an engine that way, but since you're reusing it again and again, it makes sense to do that? Is it is it some breakthrough that we've had to get for that, or what enables that? No, it, it's not really a breakthrough. Liquid propellant rocket engines are actually made to be cycled several times. Okay. And it's more a matter. It's, you know, it's about thermal management. And so if we know that's the intended purpose, we can engineer that solution. Gotcha. Okay. Let's see here. And I'm still scrolling through chat over here. Um, I do know we've got people in chat. Uh, Kurt, what are some good resources for Yule? Reference material. I know that we've got those materials that some of the people can post in a chat for us. Um, instead of us saying a URL like go to ulalaunch.com slash, instead of saying it out loud, um, I know that people can put those links for you in chat. Um, let's see here. We talked about that one. We've got this one. We've got that one. Yep. Okay. Again, I'm scrolling through. I'm looking for good questions. There's so many questions, chat. Thank you so much. There's the ability to refuel. That is good as well. I'll toss this one out here for you. Can you hint what the payload of a Vulcan Heavy to Leo would be? Is it being designed for a certain sort of area? Is it a secret that you have not released yet? Well, it, it, it's, you know, it's really about what people are going to need. You know, it's about what customers are going to ask for. And so we look into the future and in, into that marketplace, and we make educated guesses about what's going to be, you know, sort of demanded. Right. Now, the Leo payload are going to be, <clears throat> there's obviously going to be continued runs to space station, but we're also going to have private commercial habitats. So in the late 20s, uh -huh. you know, the International Space Station is going to retire because NASA is going to push further into the solar system with their exploration mission. So that's their plan. Right. So right. we're working with another company right now called Bigelow Aerospace that is developing Yes. Very large, you know, sort of giant, spacious uh, habitats that can expand and be, you know, really pretty large volume inside. And we expect that there's going to be a market for sort of backfilling behind the space station, not just for space tourism, which will be a thing, right. but also research that private companies are going to do and other countries that uh, will want to continue to have research in space that, you know, don't have the kind of access in the International Space Station because of its natural limits, gotcha. we're going to be able to proliferate that. There will be dozens of these uh, habitats floating around in LEO, uh, and people will be occupying. So you're going to go very soon from a time when there's, you know, five or six people who are, and I'm going to say working in space, not really living and working because the astronauts on the space station, and even Scott Kelly put a year in up there, I, I, yeah, I doubt yeah. he sold his house you know you know he's coming home right but we're going to be transitioning to a time when people are actually living there jobs are there so they're going to go there and that's going to be their home absolutely that makes in fact bigelow we've got some mods in ksp that kind of mirror the bigelow inflatable modules so you can install one of the one of the mods for the game um and you can have these big inflatable habitats we've even got one that rotates to generate art artificial gravity and that sort of thing um but that, I, I think there's there's a Bigelow launch coming up on a rocket launch company that won't be named, I think. Is, isn't Bigelow launching something soon? They up, are. So they're going to the ISS, a, a the smaller beams. version of that. 
Exactly. Sort of onto the ISS or kind of sort of going to attach a smaller version. Think of it as sort of a closet or a, or a, you know, ante room for the ISS to prove that technology and demonstrate all of that. Right. Here's a fantastic one. Um, read about launches of private nano satellites. What's your view on those, Mr. Bruno? And do you think that there's any market? I do know that there's kind of like a ride along program for CubeSats that ULA has. Um, where like yeah. educational institutions can build one of the little CubeSats mm -hmm. and there's like a deployment mechanism on part of the upper stages that uh, they can get time on or get a ride on basically. Um, what sorts of things do y'all do to support that sort of stuff? Yeah, well that's one of my pet projects. You know, I, when you're a CubeSat, you have to hitchhike a ride and you can't afford your own rocket. And so it's really difficult to get to space, you have to find a primary payload who's willing to let you come along, and your presence there is, of course, complicating their life, so a lot of them are reluctant to do it. Right. So you don't know when you're going to ride, you don't know, you know, if you finally get somebody to let you go, where you're going to end up, because you don't know who it's going to be, and it's really stunting that, that area. You know, universities trying to do research have trouble getting going, and the utility of these microsatellites is growing with technology every year. I think there's, you know, actually going to be proper missions that can be done as well as research. Right. And there's right. a number of startup companies trying to do that. And as hard as it is for a university with that uncertainty for a business, it's a killer. Yeah, no kidding. So we thought we wanted to break that loose. Now, you know, in a good year worldwide, there might be 50, 60 CubeSats go up. Right. I fly all the time, right? I'm flying, you know, 10, 12, 15 times a year. We'll fly 15 times this year. And there is no reason why we couldn't take CubeSats up on almost every launch. Right. So we're developing a standard CubeSat carrier that would carry 24U. They call them U for units. Right, right. 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters. And you can build, you know, larger ones that are comprised of three or four U's or whatever, but... The basic carrier will carry up 24 of these things. I'm going to put them on the back of every Centaur eventually. They will always be, you know, free use for universities doing STEM and research, and then we'll sell the rest. And I'm actually just targeting to break even. I'm not, not really trying to make any money with this. Right. Because I think the CubeSats are really the gateway to, uh, you know, utility in these smaller satellites and developing the technologies that will enable that. And there's a lot of other companies that you see out there now, like OneWeb, for example. Right. Talking about, you know, broadband internet out in LEO using very small satellites with, you know, large, large constellations and servicing parts of the world that just have no access today. Right. I think the CubeSat research is going to make that market so much more practical so we're kind of doing our part to break down the barrier and maybe let that new industry appear in a few years it makes a lot of sense to kind of enable that because instead of like the big multi-million dollar satellite where the entire launch is dedicated to this one big super capable like piece of equipment um when there's a little bit less risk i guess in the cubesat for like a small mission for like you said a smaller company or educational institution or something like that that seems like it's going to open up a lot of opportunities for them to do things that maybe wouldn't be profitable because we don't launch a lot of satellites unless we have a good reason to launch the satellites, right? Um, in terms of the exploration, just kind of pushing things forward, that is actually really, really, really cool. I'd read, I've done some reading on the CubeSats and, and kind of looked in, and at one point there was actually a group on the Kerbal Space Program forums talking about a Kerbal Space CubeSat, and we could never decide what it exactly it was that it was we wanted it to do. Um, so I know a little bit about it, but that sounds like it'll open up a lot of opportunities for places that may not, uh, normally I'm bouncing a Kerbal around the surface of the moon while I'm talking. <laughs> I don't know if you can see it. <laughs> yeah, I'm watching. It's fun. I was going to well, try and is, survey you know, a flat area to land. <laughs> so go ahead. <laughs> well, I was just going to say, you know, I'll, I'll give a plug for, for a CubeSat team. I was just at Rensselaer Polytechnic up in upstate New York uh, a few days ago talking about cis lunar economy and whatnot, and they have a CubeSat team, and they briefed me on their design. The mission for their CubeSat is to go out and capture in deorbit orbital debris, which ah. we were talking about this. 
Gotcha. And it was a really cool concept. You know, you could take big swarms of these things, and they would fly around and find debris and pull it down, and you could do that on almost every mission. That would be cool. As a secondary payload. Yeah. So I'm, I'm typing in my flag. My uh, little Kerbinaut here has identified a nice flat area to land, and this looks like it may be a good place for us to put a refining operation. Um, because instead of being on like a you know 20 degree slope, um, we'll try to bring this over here. I just wanted to fly over that way. Now I just hope that I have enough jetpack fuel to get home. Since we're all arcadey, a lot of the times when we move our Kerbals around, we just use their jetpacks. Point of interest: the Kerbal's jetpack has about 600 delta V in it. Um, it's not displayed anywhere in the game, but it has been calculated by fans, and there are bodies in the Kerbin system that a astronaut using only his jetpack can go into orbit. <laughs> um, but I'm going to fly him back over here. Let me see here. Oh, here's a good one. If an opportunity existed, would you be interested in visiting space personally? Absolutely. So, like, come on. <laughs> so what not, sort of question is that? Sure my... I'm not sure my wife will let me go. <laughs> <laughs> you'll be you'll be right back. It's well, I don't know. This whole like long-term infrastructure you're developing, be right back may be a uh, a little bit harder of a sell with Aces and Cis Lunar 1000 in place. <laughs> um, let's see. I oh, I can't do that or I'm going to kill the Kerbal. Yes, that's not good. He can slide a little ways. Um, somebody asked a question about how many parts on the rockets that you're working on are comprised of composite materials. Um, oh. a lot. A yeah, lot. a lot of the structures, a lot of the structures are composites. And in fact, as time goes by, you will see a lot of the even the existing parts on on the Atlas and Delta transition to composite parts where they're metallics now. Right. And those are. And then the other technology that you'll see come on board is additive manufacturing. So, you know, that's another game changer because it. It's so much faster and potentially so much less expensive to manufacture items on a, you know, additively that I think uh, beyond even that, you know, that obvious business case, right. it's going to lower the threshold for innovation so that engineers are free and able to experiment and try things and reduce it to hardware and find out if it's going to work or not, kind of take the bigger risks for the bigger payoff because now there's time to do it or before it takes so long to get certain things fabricated, you just can't take that risk and still meet your schedule. Right, because the things are fabricated, not not just in time is the wrong term there, I guess, but fabricated specially for the mission, and there's a long lead time. There's actually a mod in KSP sure. called Kerbal Construction Time, where you have to take into account the amount of time it would cost it would cost you to build the rocket. So if you have to do like a rescue or a resupply mission, you've got to plan it in advance because of the lead time that y'all have to deal with in real life. <laughs> exactly. I mean, the standard the standard span in the launch industry is to order your ride to space two years before you go. Right, that's the that's current everyone... standard. Yes, yes, it is. Jeez. I'm going to change that by the way, but so stay tuned. I, I, I won't say more than that. But that sounds but good. Today to is two, two years. <laughs> two years. Um, is the is the systems and architecture going to kind of help out the plans that we've heard about capturing or harvesting? asteroids. Is that part of the plan? I mean, once you get an infrastructure up there in place, certainly you can do a lot of different things with it. I know all the materials I've seen have been kind of like moonar or lunar kind of focused. Um, are asteroids a thing with y'all? Absolutely. So, the, you know, the really exciting thing about those discoveries is, you know, the, the resources that are very rare here on Earth. That right. Really cause a lot of challenges and, and even, you know, sadly conflict around the world. They're only rare on our planet because our planet has a molten core, and these things that are rare are dense things that over the eons yep. have literally sunk through our crust and disappeared into the core. On the near-Earth objects, the asteroids between here and the moon, over 1,500 of these objects, those materials are there in such abundance it defies imagination. And there will be a... a very important part of this cislunar economy, which is going out there and mining that stuff and bringing it back. Absolutely. Man, we have 10 minutes left. <laughs> the time flies when the Kerbal is skidding across the surface of an extraplanetary body, I guess, is the way to say it. Um, let me see. There's so many good questions, y'all. We're, like, going through. The mods are checking things. Oh, Skype. 
or oh snap if you could check skype for me because we have something that we want to show off a little bit um while we've got you on here i wanted to go through and i wanted to design like a refinery but an hour for designing a refinery i mean just like in real life it takes a lot of time to make the refinery look really cool um in kerbal space program <laughs> Um, so I don't think I'm going to get the refinery done. I want to make a 40-ton refinery that could go up on my Delta IV sort of thing. I'm looking around. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. <laughs> what role does design and aesthetics play, if any, in ship design, especially? You, I think oh, I think when you go you. to space... <laughs> go ahead. I'll let you take that one. We, yeah, you know, it is so hard to go to space. Right. You know, especially from the surface of the of the earth which as you put it is a very deep gravity well that honestly it's it's all about function right and, you know that drives everything and some you know some rockets are are i think are beautiful to look at you know the aerodynamic environment yep. that they have to fight through is dictated you know physics-based solutions mm -hmm. that i think are aesthetically pleasing but no, we we rarely think about how it's going to look because it's so hard just to make it work. Right. So you you put the you put the paint for the uh, ULA logo on the side of the fairing and that sort of stuff. You'll pay for that, right? Um, but in oh, terms yeah. of making like awesome like 1950s car curves or something like that on the outside of the rocket, uh, that would by uh, adding mass to it decrease the performance of the rocket, and we want that rocket to be very performant as opposed to be very awesome to look at but because it's very performant it tends to be very awesome to look at is the way that i normally say it plus lights you have it exactly i have to put a lot and of you know, fashion on my crafts so so i gotta put in a i gotta put in a plug for our guy you know you mentioned putting you know the ula logo and of course the mission logo on the sides of the payload fairing those are painted by hand wait really by a local artist. yes yeah there's a local guy out in the community where our factory is and he comes in and he paints those by hand, every one. No kidding. So every, all the kind of, I'm going to say art, and it's like logos and, and important information, like the name of the mission and stuff. Um, those are all hand-painted on the sides of the fairings? Yes, absolutely. And, or the fairings and the, the tanks and that sort of stuff. Is there any sort of like special materials? Like does he use like super special space paint or something? Or is it like he goes to Home Depot and gets no. some bare home it's this, it It is the paint that he is accustomed to using. Really? Uh, by, you know, obviously the paint doesn't make it to space, generally speaking, but by the time the paint is gone, you can't see it anymore, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. No kidding. That's I had never heard that. That would be a very, very interesting sort of like video, you know? Yeah. Like a something yeah, that covers should, the guy that yeah. paints those things on the side of the rocket. That would be really, really, really interesting. Chat, I don't think anybody... Has anybody in chat ever heard of that? I don't know... We've got 1,300 people here, and I don't know if any of us knew that those were hand-painted. That is so cool. <laughs> I love your video idea. I think we'll do that. <laughs> huh. Excellent. Um, so I, I hopped back over to the VAB here. I'm grabbing a couple more questions. Ah, here's the thing. Here's the link I've been looking for. Um, I know that you're aware of this, and, and you've kind of seen some of my designs. Like, I'll bring up my Delta IV right quick which would be my fuel launch that I did last night. So mm -hmm. in the stock game, right, for KSP, we can really only get so far. When we want to design something that, that looks like our favorite rockets, like like Delta or a coming up uh, blah, 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 sorry, coming up Vulcan, um, we can get kind of close. And I've got kind of a, a stab at my own sort of uh, Delta IV heavy here, which doesn't really look right because the top is, like, super long. Um, We've talked about mods in the game, and one of the things that we can do is we can actually create new specialized parts for the game. So I wanted to say thank you to ULA, because ULA has been talking with us about putting out an actual Kerbal ULA mod pack. And Mr. EJ here sent me some of... EJ is the, one of the other streamers, one of our Kerbal Space Academy guys, who's been doing some of the modeling, and he put together like a really quick infographic um, on some of the parts that we may have available in the ULA mod pack. So I don't know if you've seen this graphic specifically before, um, mm -hmm. but we've got some Vulcan hype on the bottom of it. We've got... We started to work on some BE4 engines. Those seem like they may be important for the future. Yep. Right? Um, we've got aces in there, and we've actually got, we, we went through the stuff, right? And we read the information we had available, 
Um, and we saw that ACES was going to be configurable for like a different number of engines depending on the mission payload, right? So, so there was something that said right. it could be changed. So in the mod pack, we would have our ACES not only just look like it, but also be like configurable for different types of engine or different numbers of engines for different missions. And we're going to get some SRBs because we all know YOLA stands for a, what is it? Unbalanced launch activities because you, you do the <laughs> unbalanced launch, right? The asymmetrical boosters sometimes. Um, yes, yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> somebody in chat came up with that one. I can't, I can't take the, I can't take credit for that one. Um, I'm wondering <laughs> if these will be gimbaled boosters, EJ. I don't know the answer to that yet. But guys, right now on the screen, I'm showing off something that ULA has has been kind of like helping us, us with, providing some reference materials and stuff for us, so that in the future, not ready yet. Clearly, these are unskinned models. We'll be able to play with some of the up and coming technologies that we've talked about such as Vulcan, such as Aces. I, mean, I think we might have a Zeus sort of thing coming up. Um, but we'll be able to add those into the game. And instead of me kind of, you know, kludging together my Delta Four Heavy here, where if you want the engine to look right, you've actually got to put an extraneous part on the bottom of it, then snack the engine up into there like that. Instead of having to do that, we'll just use EJs, and we've got an entire team working on it, um, We'll use the actual mod, and I would definitely look forward to doing some streams and replicating some missions using this mod pack instead of me doing it in chat. So I, I had to tell people that I was going to show them that before while you were on here. Um, but thank you so much for working with us on this project. It is fantastic. It is our pleasure. That's going to be so cool. I'm going to have to be careful that all of my guys aren't out just playing Kerbal all day long just instead of doing the real work. <laughs> <laughs> One day you'll walk into a meeting, they'll be like, yeah, it's fine, it's fine, we, we simulated it in Kerbal. No, it was accurate, we used the ULA mount pack. Like, that will be a meeting <laughs> meeting conversation at some point. <laughs> Who needs the sixth off model? We've got Kerbal now. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. All that. Ah, it's okay. Kerbal's actually thirty nine ninety nine on the Steam store. Let's just download that and you do all our simulations with that. <laughs> and chat, chat is definitely saying thank you as well. And we're a very involved community. And when we can get um, individuals such as yourself, companies such as ULA, involved with us to kind of bring some of this information and just explanation, and just excitement about what we're doing, um, it really does mean a lot to us. And I imagine there's a lot of people in chat right now who would have never have even guessed that they would be interested in some of the things we talked about on the stream today. They may play video games, but via the fact that we're playing video games and we're on Twitch, they can discover new things. So it really, really, really does mean a lot to us. The time that you've spent with us, just thank you so much. Oh, it's my pleasure. I mean, I love the game, and I I love what Kerbal does for STEM. You know, it's it, it's not just fun to do, but it it really helps people understand what goes on in space. And even if they're not, you know, a space professional or someone who's going to pursue a career, you know, space touches your life every single day, every one of us. And this is just a really cool way of connecting with it. Absolutely. It, it just really is. It opens it up to, to people who may have been intimidated by it. I can't understand that. That's rocket science. That's for nerds. You know something? We're all nerds. We love being nerds. We love talking about this stuff. And, and to have you on the show with us, kind of talking through and watching me perform mission shenanigans. <laughs> um, I do completely appreciate it. Any, any sort of parting words? My clock says two more minutes. Well, I just want to say uh, how much fun I've had tonight. I mean, you're, you, the chat group asked fantastic questions, and uh, this was really a blast, and I kind of loved watching you fly out to the moon while we were talking. Uh, <laughs> you're a little bit better at playing Kerbal than I am. <laughs> That's okay. I, I play Kerbal for a living. I uh, crash rockets so that y'all don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Excellent. Well, sir, um, this I do not think will be the last time I hope that we get to hang out. I look forward to uh, working with ULA and Kerbal in the future. Thank you so much for the time. Go ULA, go Kerbal. Yeah. Oh, my pleasure, and I'd love to be back. Excellent. Thank you so much for your time. We will see you on the flip side. All righty.